there and welcome to another episode of the Performance Cafe. Really glad to have you here today. And today, sadly, we part ways with a book, Rehumanizing Leadership, that I've been speaking about the past couple of weeks. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, but it has been, even the first couple of pages have just been such a riveting read and I will continue reading and maybe I'll come back with a couple of more learnings later. But I felt we sort of needed to pull the threads together on this in that there were a lot of learnings and I was constantly peppering it with other sources as well. Um, but I wanted to sort of teach you the three big takeaways that I got from as far as we got in the book. And uh, just to recap, first we looked at you know, purpose and meaning in business. And, and that was the beautiful episode, I think it was the first one, where we saw that actually humans were set up once they started being more agrarian, came together, had to deal with life in groups, and developed much more empathy and a need to work together. And because of this functional need to work together, the empathy had to be there so that they could communicate and make sure that they remained, they remained bonded as a, a tribe or a team or whatever you may. Then we fast forwarded a bit. We did speak about the Industrial Revolution and the impact it had on removing the dignity from employees and workers and operators as they used to be known uh, in the industrial era because they would operate machines and we looked at the shift from that operator who that person is what their knowledge base is and you know what was expected from them at work and how it affected their society to the fact that we now have millennials and gen z's and knowledge work and life looks entirely different and that it's best to actually go with that flow and I think the thing that we can really thank the millennials for is that they weren't going to go for this lack of dignity. They wanted a purpose. They wanted to work for purposeful companies and they wanted to have purpose and value in the company. And I think they kind of said something that a lot of people had felt for a long while. But either we didn't know it was available to us or we just didn't know how to ask. And then we took a look at, well, how do we manage this? You know, what's the shift from things like my manager, my boss to my coach? Uh, things like performance management to actually just regular feedback that can keep us moving forward. And then we also took a look at the mission and the vision and the strategy in a company and that vision and its why and how we can connect it to the why and the vision of each individual, which is what our millennials were pushing for. And then how actually that vision of the company can actually be broken down at each level until it makes sense and shows each individual how they belong and how they value, how they are valued, sorry. And in the last episode, we just took a look at why we hate work. And we understand that no matter how much we try and move forward and, and send positive messages and research all of these things, sometimes it's just a cultural phenomenon. And that's what we learned about work. We learned that way back in ancient Greece, in all of, in the beginning of Christian or the beginning of the Christian story, so to speak, we saw how through all of the decades work has been seen as punishment. So you must pitch up and you must be here from eight to five. And I don't have to make your world a better place. And I don't have to make you feel needed or valued or meaningful. And I don't have to actually listen to what's going on in your personal life because I pay you to be here. And so we see in sharp contrast how that stereotype actually can bite into all the work that we're doing. And we have to work against that as well. And uh, I think there's a good clue for culture shift in organizations right there. So to wrap it up, what are the major learnings that I got from this? So I think firstly, when we say rehumanizing, a lot of people feel like, oh, touchy feely. Oh, I'm going to have to ask them about their family. I'm going to find out about their grandmother's ingrown toenails. I'm going to have to care about the fact that their baby didn't sleep. And yes, those things we actually do need to do, we do need to do, and we do need to get, I think touchy-feely is actually just another word for human connection. But I also think that we've shown quite consistently over the past couple of weeks, how by reducing stereotypes 
And actually by having people feel that they are valued, that they belong, that they support the purpose of this business and that we, they work for a purposeful business and how we ask that everyone has empathy with each other, that it's not just the touchy feelies. It's not about holding your hand when you're crying. It's sometimes just walking up and saying, hey, I can see you taking strain with that report. Anyway, I can help, right? That is still human. That is still to acknowledge that we can't do everything ourselves and that we do need help. And this leads me to my next point. And that is, there's a TED video that I watched this week by Kelly McGonigal, um, and it is called How to Make Stress Your Friend. And it's a beautiful video. Please go and watch it. I'm by no means doing it justice in a couple of seconds here. But what she does do is she shows towards sort of the last third of the video how one of the stress hormones, now we know cortisol and we know adrenaline, right? We're used to those two doing their thing. But another stress hormone is actually oxytocin. And I went like when I was listening to this, I went, wait, what? Because oxytocin is actually the hormone that allows us to create and appreciate interpersonal connection. So, you know, when you hug someone, they, 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 they release oxytocin. It just so happens that our stress and our nervous systems have an inbuilt trigger to support us when we stress. And it's called oxytocin. Because when we release oxytocin, when we are under stress, we actually reach out to others. It's easier for us to reach out. And that just shows that even biologically, we are not set up to be these stalwart, independent types that we think we are. Even our bodies, our chemistry knows that actually having a hand to hold and a tough time, having someone to speak to and connect to makes all the difference. And that comes to my next point and that is that as managers and leaders let's prioritize time to make the connection to have those conversations i have a friend veronica kitzman cronier she's one of our uh, previous coffee companions and she has the most amazing thing her team is maybe about eight or ten people and every morning as she walks in she just goes to everyone and greets them and I one day saw this happening and realized she was having a five minute meeting with all of them. And she, from that five minute meeting, understood where everyone's at, what's their challenge for the day, how do they feel? And she was having a conversation, right? This wasn't like planned. This was not like, you know, 10 steps to magic management. It's just who she is. She just goes and checks in. And that's all that we need. So what would it take for you as a manager just to do that five minute check in every single day? Now, what's really interesting is so many people, when I say that, say to me, oh, but if I had to spend five minutes with all of my people every single day, I'd never get anything done. Well, it's quite interesting, but when we don't connect with people, we don't know where they're getting stuck and we don't know where their challenges are. One of the uh, insane things that happens is that things go wrong. And I think all of us understand how very, very taxing it is on our work days when we have to pick up the pieces afterwards. So I was reading this book by Rory Vaden called Procrastinate on Purpose. And one of the really interesting things that he says is that people, he calls them magnifiers, people who are incredibly successful at magnifying their time, at working really well within their time and time manage well, he calls them magnifiers. He says, and what they do is that they do things and ask themselves, what is the return on time invested. So yes, his example is automation. We automate something to make it easier. So it might take us 15 minutes to do the macros in the Excel spreadsheet today. But in probably in two or three days time, that return on investment will be that those macros will be there and every time we can just fly through the work. And he says, I would ask the same with people. Connecting with people, understanding where they are, understanding their challenges before things go wrong, what would be the return on investment uh, for you on that time spent? I think you'd be amazed at how well it'll save you time. Then lastly, so often as managers, we're learning how to manage others successfully. And that's brilliant. But sometimes I think there's space for us to learn how to manage ourselves successfully. And I want to ask you, given what we've learned this past month, what would you feel? 
if your boss incorporated some of these points. What would you like your boss to do to make this environment or your environment a better environment for you? Isn't it time for self-care? Isn't it time that not only do you look how much better you can manage your team, but also understand that as a human, you are subject to exactly the same stresses and the same things that are happening. Who's holding your hand? Who are you talking to? Where are you finding your support? And once you've found that, see if you can't replicate that system within your team now that you've seen the value of it. And so I hope you've enjoyed this month's worth of uh, uh, talks. I certainly enjoyed the book. We'll be continuing, continuing to read and ponder. It might pitch up uh, somewhere else again. As always, if you've enjoyed this interlude, please, there's a button somewhere on the bottom of the page. Uh, please like and uh, click on the notification bell if you're in YouTube. If you're joining us from LinkedIn or Facebook, thank you for joining us. We appreciate to have you here. Please comment, share, and uh, yes, let us know what you think. And then pop back to YouTube and come and like our channel here as well. But until the next month, where I think we're going to have a new topic, I'll see you again at the Performance Buffet.